Hi, everybody. In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. Our journey will make many stops, interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians, publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers. And we're asking them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Salvador Alcantar. Salvador is a lawyer. He's focused on digital copyright, educational technology, and digital communications. And he's also the co-founder of Wikimedia Mexico and of Creative Commons Mexico. Um, and he also was a manager of the general direction of digital communications of the Mexico City government. So an ideal guest for this, uh, this World Culture podcast about copyright. Welcome, Salvador. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Hi. We're very happy we finally managed to, <laughs> to connect. It took some. It took yeah. some. Uh, it uh, took some time, but uh, very happy to have you uh, to have you on this podcast. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. Yeah. So let's let's dive right into it. Actually, um, so we've you've written about the fact that the copyright discourse in Mexico, um, well, as in other countries, of course, um, tends to favor the entertainment industry. And and I mean, I directly quote you there. Um, sometimes you feel copyright is a bunch of don'ts. And it freezes cultural activity and it requires payment for every form of use of content. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on how this is, uh, what's happening on this uh, front in Mexico, how copyright is locking up culture behind a wall because this podcast is called World Culture. So uh, um, it's very appropriate um, that you, you phrase it this way. And maybe if you want to also um could you say how this plays out more broadly in south america in general um any concrete examples that you can share of the entertainment industry especially excessive influence in this matter would also be welcome sure you know sometimes uh, you have the feeling that a uh, mexican law and maybe it, it that happens in many other countries it's like uh tailor suit made for the entertainment industry uh, so the copyright it's it's not attending the um, the feelings or the intentions of the of the of the great public of the people but one's culture it attends the idea of that everything must be a product that must be sold sold so uh, Everything that's happening in Mexico, the industry is influencing the legislators and the camera uh, to create laws specifically for uh, some purposes, but they are not attending the people that want culture. The last year, for example, uh, it was created a reform to copyright law in Mexico that attended to create some, uh, how do you could say, like a, create an, an harmony the the last year uh, the legis legislators in mexico tried to create some uh reforms uh to introduce some changes according to usmca uh, an agreement between united states mexico and canada uh, that created some some walls for the culture uh specifically in digital in, in digital models you know they created something that we call some locks for for the culture trying to introduce uh, some changes that you can for example uh, break some locks some digital locks in your uh, digital devices if you wanted to know for example to copy a book so uh, many people try to explain to the legislators that sometimes when you are an educator you are a student it, avoiding the locks, it's useful for uh, for uh, for learn something, for create uh, you know uh, a, a really educational environment. Environment. The point is that the final the in Mexico the law attends only the industry requirements, not the not the great public, and that happens all in South America and in, in Central America, in Latin America in general. The, for example, the limits and exceptions for the copyright laws are not so uh, extended like other uh, mm -hmm. other limitations. For example, recently uh, an organization called Datisoc in Uruguay they created and studied about 
limitations and exceptions of copyright in all Latin America. And they discovered that every country has their own systems. Uh, the limitations are really weak, are so, uh, just a few. There are no general limitations, for example, important ones like um, limitation for copyright for museums, mm -hmm. libraries, archives. And some countries have some exceptions that say, well, if you have, an, uh, you have a painting in a museum, you can watch it, you can photograph it freely without any, any limitations. But it doesn't happen in many countries. So mm -hmm. Mexico, you have a painting in, in, a, in a museum, and you, you need to attend to the copyright still on, uh, uh, still uh, that it is still current. And it, you need to ask for the authors that uh, to photograph the the painting in, in the in the museum. So it's not really a free ecosystem mm -hmm. in Mexico to get the culture to uh, to get some cultural objects for your own, uh, etc. So there are a lot of examples you can give that the deceptions are not uh, so. Um, how do you say that? gives you habilitation to yeah. to to be a person of culture yeah okay so so this this yeah rather weak limitation ex and exceptions regime and and if i if i understand correctly there's quite a unilateral view on copyright quite industry focused not really suited for cultural for you know users of culture um you but when um as part of the Mexican Creative Commons chapter, um, which you're a co-founder of, um, you actually received the Creative Commons grant for a publication that actually would push for some more diverging views of copyright. And this is one of the reasons why you, you were on our radar as, as, as a very interesting person to interview. Um, because, um, yeah, we would like to know what is the state of play of this work and and do you have any like important lessons or insights from it that you could share with the with the audience um mainly because you know like you you work together at this with with a lot of different co-authors who offer different perspectives right yeah yeah but the first point is that uh the copyright laws are not being created in um a multi-stakeholders point, point of view you know everything mm -hmm. it's it's biased to the industry everything is biased to the commercial point of view everything is thought that every object of culture every book every piece of music uh, is um, it's going to be have a cost for every person there are not the assumption that there are people that want to share freely that they want uh, that, that they want to, to share without any cost and it, that's happening in internet. People is sharing. People is giving their uh, their mm -hmm. products with any cost, with any barrier, with any limitation for the great public in internet. But the legislation is, it's assuming that it doesn't happen. It's forgotten that internet exists. It's forgot. It's for uh, it has forgotten that uh, the people uh, wants to live freely. Internet wants to share and. Sometimes the really nature of digital object, objects resides precisely in being shared and in being uh, circulating in the internet freely without any limitation. So sometimes happens, or oh, I have learned that copyright uh, assumes that digital life is well regulated, that people behave in only one way uh sharing and well and living the internet life so it's kind of weird how the legislations uh, the legislator create some laws without not asking the people what did you really want to do or what you are really really doing but uh but i don't know they they assume that everybody is going to share in the ways and industry wants to be shared every mm -hmm. piece of music so it's kind of weird another thing we are we are learning that there are some like um side inside uh, like we, we call it the dark side in the copyright uh, thought and uh, that it's a bunch of lawyers that everybody that defends 
with uh, really fiercely the copyright, traditional copyright, assuming that the copyright it's by itself the defense of the culture. Once one lawyer told me, well, if you kill copyright, you are killing the culture, like assuming that it's the same <laughs> thing. And that's kind of weird. That's a kind of, uh, I don't know, it, it's it's creepy sometimes <laughs> because <laughs> uh, you need the copyright definitely to create an ambience, to create an environment for promoting creation. But it's not creation itself. Creation and authorships uh, born even before copyright laws. Uh, you have culture many millennia before copyright. Mm -hmm. Copyright only created, it was created in one specific moment, in that one specific country for a specific purposes, and it was created in a pre-industrial era. So you are trying to impose criteria from the 17th century pre-industrial era to internet era. So it's kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, anachronic and even archaic to impose that kind of criteria. And uh, every every now and then I, I say to the to the lawyers, well, you are trying to impose an idea of 19th century to the 21st century, and you you no are you don't want to uh, to reject that idea to 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 try to have a new idea of how the the things can be done. So th these are these two models of thought about copyright, the new and the old and the status quo fighting with the new kinds of view, the, the, the digital era. So you have really, really, really uh, bad times having arguments with that dark side of the force in the copyright. So that's how, that's what I learned. Well, when you're talking about the dark side, um, I mean, my next question was going to be about like, um, we've covered like it, in this podcast elsewhere in other episodes, um, we've talked about copyright anxiety, um, you know, like not only the, maybe we could call it like a psychological effect on, on you know, like the fear of, of breaching copyright um, and concerns, you know, like that, that people can have when they are uh, thinking that they are breaking any, any laws. Um, and I know that you've been concerned about that, uh, as you stated uh, in your answer before, but uh, you also noticed a rise in people actually, you know, like maybe over asking for legal advice when sharing content online because, yeah. you know, like they, they're, they're just afraid of making any mistakes. Could you maybe just, just tell us a little bit, um, like, what are, the, what are these fears and, and, and these concerns uh, users in Mexico um, might have and, and what could be a way to tackle them? Yeah, the legal tradition in Mexico, it's a really traditionalist uh, and everybody is fair about having a suit. Everybody is, uh, has a feeling against being related with lawyers. <laughs> there are many sayings about being among lawyers. It's like a, like a curse, something <laughs> like that. It, you know, nobody wants to have a problem, a legal problem. Uh, and copyright has created this idea. It, it, there are a lot of merchandising behind copyright uh, lobbies, lobby, because you know everybody is trying to introduce the, the idea uh, that uh, copying is bad. Actually, there was a campaign in Mexico. It's uh, really all promoted, but by, by, by copyright that that literally can be translated that. Cop pirating is stole. No, it's stolen. Uh, you, if you copy something, you are stealing. And it was introduced really, really hard to the uh, to the mind of the people. It's really, really in the mindset of Mexicans that if you are copying, you are stealing. Mm -hmm. So uh, everybody, it's it has this uh, this fear, this anxiety that you say that uh, doing something in, in, in internet, it's doing something bad. Nevertheless, they are doing it. They, they know that, uh, that maybe they are uh, doing something against the law, but they are still copying, they are still sharing, they are still uh, things because it's needed. 
Why I'm saying that? You, you have the typical case of a student in this in the university, where they are in their in the classroom in any platform that you can say in, in internet, and and the teacher says you need to read this for the next week. Well, I don't have the book, and the book is mm -hmm. really really expensive in the internet. I can't afford to have the book, and the teacher says, "Don't worry, I have some copies. I have a PDF, and I share it with you. Please read it." Think in a time like COVID pandemic, where everybody was studying in that way. Nobody has access to to libraries. Nobody has uh, many money to buy everything by Amazon, and the, the students basically studied all the time in internet, all the time in their houses, by PDFs, by copies. So they are breaking the law. They maybe have this anxiety, but are doing it because they need it. To, they need to, to share the knowledge. They need to read. They need to do their homeworks. So definitely uh, the mercadotecnia, the merchandising, the, see, the mercadotecnia behind the copyright is creating this this idea that stealing is bad, that the copying is bad, but the people is fighting against it. That is quite funny. In Mexico, happens a lot that Mexico knows uh, that uh, this specific thing it's against the law, but they do it <laughs> every day. <laughs> Bes besides, there are in Mexico there are like a copy culture, mm -hmm. uh, in, really, really inside the, the, the inside the Mexican culture. You can see in the streets people selling copies of the cities of the most uh, popular cities, DVDs, uh, copies of uh, even even you can see uh, non-legal copies of books printed, uh, printed illegal copies, uh, books of copies, copies of books. So uh, Mexico really really appreciate uh, to get culture in a cheap way. And try to not to be uh, many barriers to get it. So we are fighting again against that anxiety. And at the same time, in the TV, you have a lot of announcements about uh, against the, the against the piracy, against the conduct uh, and, and behaviors. But the people is still doing it. So it's like a fight about those these two feelings. That the idea that it's bad and the idea that it's needed, and I hope the idea that it's needed is going to win that final battle. So <laughs> it's complicated, but at the same time, it's the life, the current life of Mexico. I, when I was first um, like getting into this world of copyright and copyright reform, um, one of the main examples, one of, one of the things I always remember about Mexico is that it has one of the longest or maybe even the lengthiest copyright term around the world, um, 100 years beyond after the death of the author. Is that yeah. still correct? Yeah. So I, I think it's the longest in the world. I've, I don't think I've encountered any country um, which has a longer protection uh, protection range. Uh, I think in Europe, for example, it's standardly 70, or 70 years after uh, the death of the author. Um, you've actually taken, yeah, you, you've written also extensively about you know how Mexico fails when it comes to protecting and, and feeding the public domain, um, and and I was just wondering if you could uh, briefly explain, for the sake of our audience, like what is this public domain? Why is why is it so important? And and then maybe just circle back to how in Mexico, um, you know, like this is not dealt with properly. Yeah, these two uh, the one hundred years are only for literary works, music, and photography. And we have like a differentiated terms, but the most important cultural objects are under this term, uh, 100 years after the death of the author. That's quite important because everybody thinks, ah, well, I count the 100 years from the point that uh, the, 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 the book is introduced, yeah, the publication, yeah. whatever. But no, finally, you need to count after the, the author dates. What, what is important, because I, I always put the example for, for the public that hears me, that 
think that it's a young author that write it at 16. Um, at the same time, it's a people that have a lot of longevity, you know, he deaths at 19, 100 even. You have almost 170 years of protection if you have this, if you have this zoomed on. So, uh, in Mexico, you can imagine if you apply that term retroactive, you are, uh, you have free only the publications the, or, 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 or the, or the, yeah, the, the books which authors died around the twenties before, after the, the Mexican revolution, even we have a lot of culture in that, in that decades. In the in the first two decades of Mexico history, there are a really important period called the Mexican Revolution, and you have a really important documents. You have a really important photographies of Mexico being reborn from a really hard war. So you are losing a lot of memory in that times. That's why it's important having one hundred years. Because it's not uh, it's not only about rights of, of the authors. It's also about memory. It's also about archives. It's also about uh, things that it being lost in in, in uh, during that time. Why it is important the public domain? Because when something with copyright become becomes in public domain, it becomes becomes uh, something that it's for everybody. It's not only for the author. You can have a piece of culture not being uh, privatized for one person, but being doing the, done public for the whole public. And it's not only for Mexico, it's all it's for the whole world. For every person in the world can have this piece of culture and the culture finished their course, their life. So the public domain uh, rejects the idea of ownership to embrace the idea of uh, that that culture must be taken for everybody in the world. At the final, that's the really, really, really um, objective of the culture, being an every person in the world. That's why I think public domain it's important. Besides, when you have public domain, you have something that it's a national good. I always uh, set emphasis that uh, something that that then when a state in this case Mexican nation gives some privileges for the copyright holder, it's only given given it temporarily and should be always in that way because mexican culture says well we have a here a period of time well this culture is going to be owned by somebody but at the final it must be incorporated to the whole culture in mexico and it's but it must be considered like a national a public god good so public domain is quite important for that way because we are talking about public goods. It's not talking about uh, something because, you know, I, I have the idea that, that many persons, especially the dark side of the copyright, thinks <laughs> that the public domain is like the death of the copyright. The public domain burns when something dies, no? But it's nothing, it's nothing like that. It's, it, it's a better right being born for the time. It's a little right given to the person and the public domains become a really whole right, a human right to the whole humanity. And that's quite important. You need to know the public domain like a human right thing. It's not all, it's done, it's not anymore a private right, but a human right one. Sorry if I'm extend, being extended about <laughs> it a lot. No, thank you. I, I think that's a very, that's a crucial insight and, and a very interesting way of looking at the public domain. Like we're, I'm, we're also, I'm, I'm, I have a tendency to look at it from a more technocratic perspective, like this is public domain and this is not. And I think your views 
that it is actually a human right and, and, and it's it's very it's very important. Um, a personal question maybe um, the, we call this this blog world culture and, and we're asking all of our guests um, what is do you have like uh, can you describe a particular moment when you actually hit the wall and you thought um, oh there's something wrong here. This can be like a very concrete example the moment you, you started to be interested in copyright reform and activism. Yeah, exactly. The public domain is it's, it's the thing that hit me personally. In Mexico, for example, you don't have like a catalog or an archive for public domain. You don't mm -hmm. know what it's in public domain. There are not any authority that creates like a database about public domain. In the past, the, the, the copyright register authority in Mexico had like a, some functions that create like a uh, that the base of that, but it was really in the 70s and 90s, so it was really a database. It was only archives, some paper in, in, in that they had. And if you wanted to know what was in public domain, you needed to ask the authority and they that answered you case by case. Nowadays, there it doesn't exist anything like that. And if something goes to to public domain, nobody knows. It. Nobody knows what is in, in, in public domain. Mm -hmm. We have heard some cases when authors discovered something that is in public domain, but since there's there's not a public register, they take the public domain good song or whatever. In the specific mm -hmm. case, we heard the case of the song. They took the song and they register again the song, like done by the by by themselves, and nobody knows. And oh. suddenly, the one thing that was in public domain now was again in copyright. That's something that angers <laughs> me a lot. And how do you know that that's in copyright? You need to check some archives. You need to check all books. You need to ask, mm -hmm. but nobody knows. So, so they they took advantage of that ignorance of the people. That they took advantage of that lack of uh, recognition, public recognition of the public domain. So we are creating like a cycle. Well, the people really, uh, really don't have the the cultural objects um, freed, freed, but they are creating a cycle where the copyright creates itself against and against and against when it's going to end this infinite cycle of copyright with this kind of trickery, maybe never. <laughs> well. So that's that's something that I think it's really growing. There are really a lot of a lot of emptiness in the law that creates that possibilities. And besides, if you think that in Mexico there are not many promotion or many inversion for museums, archives, libraries to promote their work, to try to create a really general memory of Mexican culture. So you have uh, uh, a bunch of institutions that lack the capacity of uh, of preserve that knowledge, and at the same time you don't have the legal uh, tools to have the public domain enforced. There are a lot of weeks of, of public domain that I can tell. For example, you 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 don't have exceptions, really exceptions that create that in the very uh, and in the very moment the copyright is leaving, you can have an exception when you can say, no, in this moment, copyright uh, can be the, the, um, the really, uh, or you can have copyright in this very moment and you need to have public domain. For example, in the, in, in the pandemic, in the past, we have for, uh, I'm going to change a little from authorships to to mm -hmm. to to marks uh, and patents if uh, we had in the past an exception where a mexican state could create 
a moment where um, if you had something with a uh, patent, for example, medical patents, for public purposes, you can create an exception and you can stop the copyright or stop the, uh, the, the rights, the right holders, and you can have public domain in this very moment only for public purposes. For mm -hmm. example, it, it could be really useful for during uh, COVID pandemia for the vaccines, but it didn't happen. It dis that disappeared from the law uh, like uh, two years ago. So it couldn't happen. That could be that some that idea like a something idea expropriation of copyright that can be introduced in in copyright for example that you can seize the copyright even when it's still in on living or, or only for public purposes maybe for example for really really appreciated paintings or works of really 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 appreciated uh, authors you can create, for example, public domain, specific public domain, even when the 100 years had no uh, happened yet. So, well, public domain is something that uh, I think it, it it's something that um, it's owned by every person in the world. So I think we can, uh, we, we should stand a really hard defense for public domain these days. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for making such a <laughs> such a clear stance on that. Um, I'm I'm just uh, I would like to move to my my closing question actually because we've discussed a sure. lot about it's it's a bit of an idealistic question. You've already like indicated I think in what direction you would like it to go. But um, how can we make all of this work in an online world? So you've already this whole conversation is basically about how Mexico's copyright legislation is not adapted to digital age. Um, but in your opinion, like if you would say like very concretely, what needs to change? How can we do this? And um, ideally, what should 2030 look like? I'm not saying what will 2030 look like, but what should 2030 look like? That's a tough question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You could free will. I mean, you can dream. Um, yeah, the first thing that I think we should have it's a uh, public hearing of copyright, mm -hmm. not only in Mexico, in every country. Like what the people is thinking about copyright, the creators, the authors, the the activists in every country. Try to ask them, what do you think about copyright? Because nowadays, in every in every country, especially in Mexico, it's quite current that uh, when a copyright bill is introduced, you ask to some specific actors in the in Mexican scene. Uh, you ask to the industry of culture. You 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 ask to the record industry, to the back industry. Um, nobody asked the people on the on the street. No, you don't ask to the universities. You don't ask to the students. You don't ask to advocates. Or you ask only to the typical lawyers, not the dark, forced lawyers. Mm -hmm. And you don't ask to the the to, 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 to copyright uh, to Creative Commons uh, chapters, for example. So, I think copyright must become a multi-stakeholder. Um, law in general it, it 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 must integrate the many visions of the many uh, kinds of words that it's being done in internet and even in the street and and try to integrate many visions of of, of the world in in in, in that you need to decolonize the colonize uh, copyright even there are not many uh, questions about what are thinking the native persons of every country about copyright. We had, for example, a, 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 really, a, a really nice work with a couple of uh, indigenous people in Mexico from the Miche community. Uh, and they was telling us in, 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 a, in a work that it is going to be published uh, in, in a few months, they are telling that for example, in Mishe community, 
uh, there doesn't exist the idea of authorship at itself. They create everything communitary. So mm -hmm. every 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 object of culture, it's being thought like like. Uh, that it's um, something that uh, owns to every part of the community. So when you have copyright being applied to indigenous uh, indigenous culture, you don't have really clear what are you telling about to them. They take the copyright and say, I don't know what you're talking about. So we need even to integrate indigenous visions of ownership and authorship to the copyright. And sometimes the copyright is being taken for great industry to try to, to how do you say it politely, <laughs> <laughs> to devorate uh, the indigenous culture, the indigenous culture. And you know you have a lot of uh, really good, um, really great uh, brands of fashion having uh, indigenous textiles being replicated in a mass, in a massive wave in their dresses, in their uh, in the fashion, the fast in the fast fashion, replicating indigenous patterns, indigenous textiles, and they are saying, "Hey, why are you having this?" That it's my culture being tri trivialized in a suit, in a dress, in whatever, and you are you didn't even ask me if I wanted to have my portion of culture in that way. So we have a lot of um, global north vision mm -hmm. in the copyright politics in all the world. We need to ask for women. If they feel comfortable with the with the authorship nowadays, because I always said that copyright is it's, it's it has a machist point of view, it's a masculinist point of view. Only the only the men have created copyright, and they always introduce their own ideas of ownership, of colonialism, of uh, being a macho man inside the copyright. So the copyright even gives an idea on how the how the world is constructed, it's, it's built. So we need to review even for the roots how the copyright copyright law it's done. So I hope in the 2030 all this ambition has been integrated to the internet. We have a copyright that gives uh, the space for freedom, the space for digital life space for the people uh, using and reusing uh, digital objects without not that fear and that anxiety that you talk about just a few moments ago. So I hope 2030 it's going to be a really good, good year for copyright. <laughs> that's my hope at least. I think that's that's a wonderful statement. <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers with you. Uh, is there anything else you want to share with our audience? Because I really appreciate the, the last points here, you about colonial colonialism and, and the masculine perspective on on copyright. Because that's not something that we covered during many other talks. I think so. For, thank you very much to bring this uh, to bring this up um, from a northern perspective. I even you know like. I forget sometimes sometimes about it and guilty as charged. So I'm <laughs> very happy, happy you, you took the time to uh, to talk about this. So is there anything else you'd like to share? Nothing else. I think <laughs> it, the copyright, well, maybe one last thing. Copyright, we need to have also a global perspective of copyright. We need to fight uh, all together against that problems of copyright. Sometimes we need help. Uh, every country need to help of other countries to to have these fights and to put attention what is happening in other countries besides ours. And that's all.